Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of This Is My Bourbon Podcast, where we discuss the spirit of Kentucky. My name's Perry, I am your host, and this week is a little bit different. I'm actually going to be on my own at the beginning and the ending of this episode, but the nice thing, though, is that in the middle, I have a really good interview with whiskey author, historian, and all around just great guy, Fred Minnick. We met up at his office just outside of Louisville, Kentucky, and we chatted about, amongst other things, uh, whiskey competitions. He caught a little bit of flack this past year, excuse me, really earlier this year, where he named, amongst uh, a, a panel of judges, Henry McKenna Bottled and Bond as overall bourbon, best bourbon in show, I believe is what it was. And uh, so we talked about that. We also talked about some of his writing habits and what got him into writing about bourbon specifically. So I don't want to spoil too much of it for you because you are, in fact, about to hear it. But I do encourage you to pour glass, sit back and uh, in- enjoy this little interview that I did with with Fred Minnick. So I'll be back with you at the end of the uh, or actually on the tail end of the interview. So see you in a bit. After you kicked me out of the restaurant last time, I didn't think you'd be inviting me How back. How did I kick you out? I feel oh, like I we got I pissed kicked you out. off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. In what way? <laughs> I'm kidding. Well, um, back when uh, we were doing the the little talk about bourbon and beyond, yep. um, we had a little side conversation before Edward, Chef Edward Lee, came in mm-hmm. about whiskey competitions. And you had just come off of the San Francisco competition i think right right after like maybe a week or two before we sat down and chatted that first time and uh we're gonna talk some about that today but i i had some other questions too i wanted to ask you and so many people of course in the bourbon world know who you are i mean you've been on how many podcasts at this point oh i don't know yeah and i mean everybody can go online and read your bio and pick up your books and everything so i don't want to talk too much about the generics of it but what i really want to ask you um, you've been around for in this world longer than a lot of people are able to maintain, especially as a whiskey writer. What is it about it that keeps you interested and in, in coming back to it? Well, I think everyone's got to find their place. Um, I got burned out probably about five years ago. I started getting burned out on just focusing on calling people out, which, you know, I do... <laughs> I did a great deal of that, and it just like I started realizing that I wouldn't have a whole, I wasn't having a whole lot of effect, you know. Sure. And it's like you know, you get you get frustrated with it, and you know, I was, uh, God bless him, Chuck Cowdery has this you know, insatiable need to do it, and I, <laughs> I, 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 I found very early on that I would have to do more than that, so I could not, I could not model myself after. Chuck and you know what what Chuck had done. I had to find my own way. Sure. And my way is kind of telling a story or like you know writing, writing creatively and, and getting into the depth of something. And I'm actually I'm launching a magazine. Right. You, yeah, I'm launching you a magazine called Bourbon, Bourbon Plus. Plus. Right. And that's the entire vision of it is telling a story mm-hmm. and getting into the heart and the soul of bourbon. And it's beyond just what's in the barrel. It's the the farmers who grow the corn and the right. mixologists who eventually make it, make a cocktail with it, mm. and you know the coopers who build the barrels. I mean, it's it's everything, but it's there's all these stories that go untold. Right. And I first learned this really when I was researching whiskey women. When I was re- researching the book Whiskey Women, I found all these women that nobody knew anyone knew anything about. Right. And and I kept finding real stories after real stories that I was like, no one's talking about this. The people who control the American whiskey narrative tend to be in boardrooms. They tend to be MBAs. And um, they think that the best way to sell their whiskey is to sell a story. Mm-hmm. And, you know, my my tasting room here is just loaded with, with stories. Of course. And a lot of them are are made up and some of them are real <laughs> like bookers 
That's one of the things I love about Booker's. I'm just grabbing a random bottle sure. here. But they have all of these little tags on their on their bourbon. And it's like a real authentic story connected to Booker No. Right. And I, I love that about what they've done. Do I like the price point hike? No, not necessarily. <laughs> but, you know, that's part of business. That's part of what they do. But so that's kind of like how I've been able to... Stan, I also, I, I really mean this. I try to be responsible. I try to be of responsible. I've seen, I've seen a lot of writers not be able to stay in the business because they get too intoxicated. They, get, they go to an event and they make an ass of themselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, there have been writers who got, or bloggers who got really hammered at an event and would go up to someone and say, hey, I write about you guys all the time. Um, you don't spend any money with me. And, you know, so I've never been that guy. I've never been the guy. I never, I try to never ask for anything. There's a lot of people. I mean, I'll ask for things if, like, if I'm doing a charity. Sure. Uh, I do a lot of charity work. Right. And I'll ask for a bottle. I'll ask for, I'll ask for things like that. But I never try to ask for something that I believe would, you know, is going too far or compromising myself. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of people who get in this business, and the first, and all, all they can see are the dollars. Right. You know, that's all they can see. And that's someone that's not really passionate about it, doesn't really care about the other people. And I care deeply about bourbon, and I care about the people connected with it. And being able to tell those stories has always been kind of like one of my great honors, you know. So as, as a writer and a reviewer, did you come into this field with that I, that ideal, that set of notions, or was that something that you kind of had to develop over your... When I, when I first started course. writing about bourbon, which was 2006, 2007, I was just trying to get someone to let me write. And I was at the time, I was writing about everything from landscape management to uh, sewage drain systems to, uh, you know, you the, 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 bourbon, the bourbon trail. <laughs> And and it was not it was not a it was not um, I mean it was it was a lot of work to get people to let me write for them but really I had a lot of breaks uh, and my and my biggest break my I've kind of I've kind of studied it because I've been asked a lot of like what what was the moment where you kind of what was your big break sure and I was a stringer for the Louisville Courier Journal as a sports writer. And this is after I'd been in Iraq and I come on, I'm, I'm trying to establish myself as a writer right. in whatever in whatever way I can. And um, I, I'm re- covering anything the Courier Journal wants me to. So I'm basically going to like high school track meets, soccer games. I'm going to everything, covering everything. Mm-hmm. And the guy who covered the Louisville Bats broke his ankle. And the editor called me up and he says, can you cover the bats tonight? I said, absolutely. I'll be there. <laughs> I'll be there. He's like, great, be there in five minutes. Oh. So I'm, I'm assuming he went down his list. Sure. He went down his list of people who, uh, whom he tried to get to go. Right. He was probably last on that list because <laughs> that was five minutes out. And fortunately, I lived downtown at the time, and I sprinted to, you know, to the game, and I made it, <laughs> and I covered it. And after that, the editor started recommending me for jobs. And that's awesome. There was uh, that shortly thereafter, there was a what they call the Senior Olympics. Like this is where people, you know, 60 and older were competing in, in Olympic mm-hmm. Olympic events. And a magazine called Elder was covering it. The guy who's behind Elder was uh, the founder of a PC World and Mac World. And he helped um, Bill Gates in the first like P, you know PC that's being created incredible. like a really incredible magazine lineage right and he reached out to the courier journal and said hey do you have any sports stringers you recommend <laughs> and the editor uh, took that call and he recommended me wow and the guy from elder liked my work so much the next the next day he says hey could you go to france for me <laughs> And cover and cover some uh, some some wine from some wine country. Wow! And talk about right place, right time. Sure, sure. And I was, you know, said absolutely. <laughs> so we go to France, and I'm trying, you know, and I'm covering this the the wine scene, and I end up 
somehow in a room with a guy that's suing. The, so this was this was in Saint Emilion, mm-hmm. and Saint Emilion's like this legendary classic uh, Bordeaux area. It's like one of the great empires of wine, right. or little regions. Like some of the best wine ever is made there. And this guy is in the middle of suing the classification system because he feels like he's be, being treated unfairly. Jeez. He never gave any interviews, never did anything. And I had no idea, no, no clue whatsoever <laughs> who this guy was Flying or blind, what was going sure. on. And he told me the entire story. And so I had like this wow. only interview with this guy for it, and I ended up figuring out what was going on, and I would end up chopping that up and selling that story in several different publications. Right. Even got, I think I... I got, eventually got a little play with like Wine Spectator, mm-hmm. but I was that was that was uh, and I had already written some bourbon stories at that time, but I was like, all right, I feel like I have an opportunity to carve out a niche as a wine and spirits writer. Sure. So I was I was going more broad uh, early on, and when I did that, I I was focusing largely on on wine, like the bourbon stuff would come when it came. But the wine, the wine was where I really honed in my kind of like reporting, and that's where I started really building my industry cred. Mm-hmm. And um, I then got a a column in a magazine called Tasting Panel. They right. said, uh, "Hey, uh, you're in Kentucky. Can you write a? Can you cover Kentucky bourbon for us all the time?" Mm-hmm. I'm like, "Hell yes!" I want to do that. <laughs> so that was like that was like 2008, and. I kept doing wine and, and uh, bourbon pretty much about the same. Right. And then in 2012, I was up for uh, the Louis Roederer Best Wine Writer in the World mm-hmm. for the emerging category, so people under 35. Right. And I'm in this room with Jancis Robinson and Robert Parker and all these great icons of wine, and all I could think about was, like, I just want to be around Jimmy Russell. Right. I want to be around Parker Beam and Fred No. Right. I was like, I didn't want to be around wine people. I want to be around <laughs> bourbon people. And that was the moment where I decided that I didn't want to focus on wine anymore. I, that's when I went in all in on on uh, on bourbon. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the next year, Whiskey Women came out. And right. that was best decision I ever made in my career. And it wasn't anything that you felt like you had to kind of seek out. It just came naturally. Yeah, it was. It really was. Like, there are some things that... Like I used to have a, I used to write for a magazine called Stores, it was ran by the National okay. Retail Federation, and I was there, um, kind of like a like a technology reporter, and that was so painful. <laughs> that was, I mean, I it, every time I had to, to write one of those stories, it was like, it was so painful. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it paid well, and the people were really nice, but uh, so I I was I did this interview about a point of sale system. And that's the thing where you put your credit card in and they swipe right. it and the, every, the restaurants push buttons and everything. Mm-hmm. And the the interview subject said the word solution 250 times <laughs> during like a five-minute interview. And I was like, I can't take this anymore. <laughs> but I was not in a position where I could walk away from it. Like sure. As a writer, you get you get what you can get. Right. And, and that was... A, that was when I was able to separate from them, I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> I, I mean, I loved them, but I, I loved them personally, but I hated the work. Oh, yeah, right. uh, but if I ever, that's the thing is like, that didn't come naturally to me. Sure. Writing about point of sale technology and HR technology in the retail space did not come natural. However, tasting something and tell you exactly what I taste in it is, it comes very naturally to sure. me. Well, speaking of tasting, why don't we taste something? Yeah, so, so you brought out a little Henry McKenna, huh? I did bring a little Henry McKenna, and I figured it was appropriate since... Um, since that's what's won the that's San, what won Francisco. San Francisco this yeah. year. But this has been kind of my coveted bottle of, of McKenna for a, a little while. Well, I appreciate you bringing it, because yeah, there's course. not much left. Well, I figured why not. Good bourbon was meant to be shared and consumed, so... Good. Sorry. <laughs> it's a little hot for you? No, it just went down a, in an odd way for a second there. Mm. Uh, it could be, the, uh, could be the angle. You know, sometimes the way you sit will really impact oh, that's, that's like how too. it goes down. Yeah. Um, These are not the best chairs to be sitting <laughs> in. 
<laughs> for bourbon drinking. <laughs> no, th- these are not bourbon drinking chairs. These are more like sitting out on a patio smoking a cigar. And, right. You know. Right. So what I've always found about this one that's kind of separated it is that it has, to me, an earthy quality to it that I don't usually find mm-hmm. um, in typical McKenna bottles. And especially... Now, what kind of earth? Are you talking like been out in the jungle for a little bit and you got some <laughs> uh, armpit sweat going on? Or are you talking about... See, we, this is this is what separates me, I feel like, from a lot of, of other course. people. Like when I hear when I hear someone say earthiness to it, like I want to I nail that down. Sure. Like I want to know what kind of earth. Is it like licking the dirt? Is it like, is it a mushroom? Is it some guy's, you know, <laughs> fungus on his toes? What, what What's that smell? You know, there's all kinds... You can go... Earth can be any different direction. It's like sure. So you break that down for me. For me, it's more of that dirty, soily kind of taste to it, and I guess that comes from the barrel char, potentially. Or you know, I, I, I think I, and this is something that I have, I have really, I learned this in wine. Is that yeah. you can't, as a taster, you you cannot. You cannot get too focused on where something comes from, from a taste. You can just say, like, it tastes a certain way. Like, uh, there, there are sure. some things where you can't, like, you can say, oh, that's heads and tails and all that. So, like, when I'm doing these, when I'm doing a lot of these competitions, you sit, you do it with a distiller. Um, distillers are great at their jobs and what they do. Right. They're often very bad. They're often very bad, like, um, you know, tasters on like a on a panel <laughs> because they're trying to ascertain whether or not, you know, that spiciness is coming from a rye or if it's coming from um, a barrel or, okay. or a yeast or whatever uh, versus just saying it's spice and moving on as to whether like how it is, okay. you know, so they focus so much time on like where something comes from. I did a, I did a, a panel with a guy who was breaking down like bad distillation after bad distillation. I was like, you know, you, that's great that you can do that, but that's not necessarily the point of right of assessing something. You're you're giving somebody uh, to you know, a, a, you're giving them feedback on their distilling technique. This is what they put out. So you gotta you gotta assess them for what they put out. But for this, I definitely I talk a lot. I mean, no, man, it's okay. Wonder, this is why this is why you're here. Mm. I get. You know, I, I I get this. Um, I I get like a. First of all, I get like a cornbread, like a really really sweet cornbread, um, like a, a brown brown sugar butter, a little bit of brown sugar butter on there, mm-hmm. and then um, a very. Uh, I don't want to say a fungus, but it's like a mushroom, like a. <laughs> Which a mushroom is a fungus, sure, but it's like a, like a pan seared mushroom, and that would be you know that would be earth, you know. So sure. you're, this definitely does not have a typical uh, McKenna profile. Right. I would say this this would skew a little bit toward turkey, like some of the wild turkeys mm-hmm. I've had. Uh, so this is certainly not the classic caramelly, right? And um, and that's something too that we've just kind of discovered sharing it with other people too is we've all gone how did this skew so far away from the typical mechanic profile you know why how did it become an outlier why is it not as consistent as some well other models? I, you'd have to get inside the heaven hill tasting system you know <laughs> i mean there's when they're selecting this for that product you know um they're you know the it was like who was selecting them that sure. day like what were they feeling what were they what was their mood what did they right. just eat? What impact? And with all that said, it's very good. Mm-hmm. It's very good, and this would this would do very well in uh, in whatever setting you put it in. Good. Well, that yeah makes me happy to hear <laughs> reaffirmation. Well, let's talk too about a very specific setting that you found yourself in with Henry McKenna, mm-hmm. which was the San Francisco okay spirits competition. This it, it's no secret now that this won first in show. Yeah, it won best bourbon. Be- best bourbon. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. And now it's started flying off the shelves at a scary rate. I had absolutely nothing to do with <laughs> any of that. 
None but people that. like to blame you for that, though. Oh, I get blamed for a lot of shit. Well, sure. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I left the garage door open, <laughs> and I get blamed for that. I mean, sure, it was my Regardless fault. Regardless of whether or not it's your fault. It, I mean, <laughs> seriously. I mean, if there's... I mean, I, I, I've, I've learned... Um, this started about... This... this um, there's a fucking spider floating down. Look at this. Look at it. Come here. Look at this. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> wow. He he, he, wa- he wants a little seriously? McKenna, huh? Oh my oh, god. He, he went for it. He seriously. <laughs> we have a spider walking into my glass of McKenna. He's like, hell yeah, it's got Bourbon some spider. earth to it. <laughs> oh, he's following it too. Yeah. That was incredible. He's not in there oh. anymore. Yeah, he's gone. He moved out. <laughs> All right, what were we talking about? <laughs> Uh, when you were first figuring out that it was your fault. <laughs> oh, okay, all right. So in 2011, I was uh, really championing uh, a product called Weller 12 Year Old. I don't think I've ever heard of that. Just and, <laughs> and this was in my tasting panel column, mm-hmm. and I was just like, I was mentioning it all the time. And that's a trade journal. And right. so trade journals, that, that was something that people would read and they would buy it, and then they would put my tasting notes on their shelf, and that things would start moving then. Oh, okay. And so, I was wondering where those came from. <laughs> and that was uh, that was the first one of the first times that I had kind of, you know, seen that. Right. And um, you know, McKenna, McKenna was certainly that was an unfortunate one because yeah, I, this that's what I bought. It was that was my house whiskey. Yeah. So, and it was for a whole lot of people too. Yeah. And, <laughs> But I think that also just shows that, you know, well, hey, at least I'm not too far off. Sure, sure. Know? But but it, I try to point out that, you know, I wasn't the only judge, but, you know, it, was, it would be, I mean, it would be my blog post that would get a lot of attention, but uh, I was definitely not the only judge. And the fact is, man, fucking good shit. No, yeah, absolutely. You know? I mean, it stands up. I really did get hate mail, though. Oh, I'm, I'm sure and you I, did. I was wondering, I was like, I wonder how much of it was tongue in cheek, you know? And how much of it was like there's little fucking voodoo dolls out there sure. <laughs> poking me or something? But well, how do you? Th- this is a very odd and kind of personal question, but how do you deal with some of those more hate laced criticisms of your your review? I think about do you just brush them off? Well, or? I think five five years ago it would really hurt me. Like I would sure. have five years ago it was like uh, I would see it. I would never. I wouldn't really respond to it but i i would see it and i was like man what, what am i doing wrong and you know the, one of the common things is like uh you know you do it for free stamp i mean you're in my office right now this is a this is low mm-hmm. you know i mean obviously i'm not doing anything for a free sample no. so i'm not hurting for whiskey right and um that started changing when when bloggers started coming out who really did do things for free samples that, that's never been me right um, you know, that, that started changing. Um, but usually when I get, when I get called out or someone is like going after me for something, it's, they, they defer, they defer with my opinion. They don't, they don't agree with me on something. Um, and that's fine. Sure. You know? But what bothered, you know, that, and when I started realizing that we're all just a bunch of our own opinions and then, you know, I have my opinion and, and believe me, I've had this, I get it from both ends. Like distillers will pull me aside and fucking ream me, and CEOs and uh, chief marketing officers will do the same, and then consumers will do the same. So I get it for both sides. Mm-hmm. Um, all of that to me is now just fun. It's part of the game. <laughs> but five, but five years ago, it had a little bit of an impact on me. Sure, and it was especially you know when it came from friends because I have a lot of friends who are very much in the whiskey scene. And then they would kind of start laying on me in the, some of the forums. Mm-hmm. And I was like, "Dude, what, 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 what is that about?" It's like he's like, you know, you you don't realize you're not. People don't think of you as like real. Yeah, a lot of and and I, and, I, and, what, and then I started like comprehending that, and it just kind of moved on. What has happened though, is that I've had threats made toward my kid. I've had I've had threats made uh, about me. I've also mm-hmm. had. Uh, people try to pick me up, you know, uh, a few times, and um, you know, so that's that's where I, I draw the line. And also, the bourbon community is very good. Like they're in a Louisville forum, 
there was a guy who um, made this really odd comment about, you know, attacking my son. And the bourbon community just, like, welled on him. And he could have been, it was all taken out of context, sure. and everybody was overreacting. But you don't mention my family in, in, in any contextual sense, no. in, in any form whatsoever when it's about me. Yeah. Like, say whatever you want about me. Just don't, don't say anything about my family. That's kind of upsetting, especially when, you know, drinking bourbon, I mean, at its core, is really just to be for fun. <laughs> you know, it's I a, learned it's a pastime. That, that's that's pastime. right. And I think that's how 95% of us, 95 to 99% of sure. us do it. But when I was covering the, the Pappy Van Winkle heist, mm -hmm. uh, that's when I started realizing, and that also kind of, that happened in what, 2013, 2013, 2014? So. so I'm like, God, that was a long time ago. <laughs> Pull it up. Actually, if you can Google that while I'm just sure. talking, I, I want to know what year that was because it's... Uh, I can't even remember either. Um, but that was that was the time that I started really separating all of this from like, um, like it's fun for most of us, but there's a percentage of the population out there that are just just bad people, and they're bad people no matter what. And it was specifically when child porn got pulled into that case, like they found out one of the people connected in it all was right. was had a connection in child pornography. It's scary. And that's when I was like, bourbon is fun, yeah. but there's still, there's still a portion of the people out there who are not. Sure. was 2013, by the way. It was 2013. Yeah. Okay, yeah. good. So, my, <laughs> so that, was the same, that was the same year that I started, in my mind, started separating, separating uh, like the personal connection to, to bourbon and, and, and like the writer side. Like, sure. So I, I, I can't reiterate this enough. When I made that decision, I became a lot healthier you know, because sure. that, cause that would be, that'd be the time where I wouldn't be up at night mm -hmm. what someone thought. Now it's like, eh. So do you find it's easier now to turn off the, the, the panel judge and just the bourbon expert Yeah. or excuse me, the bourbon drinker at its basis level? Is yeah, that so an easy it, switch? And, and a lot of it too is I got some close friends I can drink, like I can just hang with. Mm -hmm. And that's, that is so key. Is like so. I've I've never lost that personal fun or anything like that. But when you write something, uh, and when you are out there all the time, I mean, just in the last month, I've been on, um, I've been on several national TV shows, and I've been on. I'm about to be on an international one, and I'm just out right. there a lot, and I get, I get people who say, I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know anything. Uh, what do I know? That kind of stuff, and that just it just doesn't bother me. Sure. You know, five years ago, I probably would have been in a forty-five minute long, uh, deep pain about it, and then yeah. spend three hours writing an email to the guy, and then two hours deleting it. So, <laughs> so he would never get a response from me. <laughs> and but he feels I like he won. <laughs> yeah, but 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 I uh, I would feel it. I mean now. Sure. Now I'm fine. And also, I also have a kid now. Like, 2013, I didn't. I got another one on the way. Mm -hmm. And it's just things that can take you out of that bad spot. Right. But Well, getting back to um, the, uh, the, the whiskey competition, right after you got finished with San Francisco, mm -hmm. I don't know if it... I can't remember if it was a new article or one that he had already written in the past and reposted, but Wade Woodard... <laughs> oh, your yeah. buddy Wade Woodard had posted yeah. an article that was something along the lines of whiskey competitions are dumb or <laughs> there's a lot of people who think that. Right. I, and, you know, I, there's a lot of people who think that. So what's the value of, of whiskey competitions in your, so, in your perspective? Then? So uh, so I uh, are you familiar with when you walk? Do you eat steak? I do. Yes. OK. So when you walk into a grocery store, you see that the steak is split up by select choice and prime right and you know what those things mean but what a lot of people don't realize is that the people uh, that the packing houses that cut the meat and they pay the u.s government a service for that and the u.s government that is not a part of the inspection service mm -hmm. that's a grading service that helps sell the meat they could they don't have to put anything on it and but if they put if they if it gets graded 
and it gets select, choice, or prime, then it's going to sell more. And in the 1800s, the governments used to have a similar system for for whiskey. They would they would uh, they would have what they called a sayers, and okay. they would validate the quality of a whiskey. And then you started seeing competitions come out, mm-hmm. and it would be like a gold medal. You'll still see gold medals from the 1800s on on bottles, and that's. And, Today you will like I think uh, old Bardstown has one, Jack Daniels has one that they that they still tout from a long time ago. Is that Our spider, spider friends back? And <laughs> and so um, so those have those have a purpose for validating a particular whiskey as for quality, right? And with the competitions, that is in a, in essence a, a validation of sorts. Um, it is also business, and always, sure. you know, and Wade's strongest point in his argument is that these people uh, pay. I mean, you have to pay five, six hundred dollars to enter these competitions, right. and they they get graded, and then uh, you have to follow on as a judge. You have to follow on the guidelines you're given as to whatever the competition is. So San Francisco tells us to grade it by the glass. Like, so I am. In the first in the first leg, if you will, this glass right here, I have I have a responsibility to grade it uh, either bronze or either no metal, bronze, silver, or gold. And okay. the other people at my table have the same responsibility. Okay. We grade it and then we come around and we talk about it, and then we we come to a conclusion as to what metal it gets. Now it's very similar to the magazines. The magazines rate, sure. um, they rate on a, on a number scale. So I, I kind of put it in context that the 70s are, are the bronzes, the 80s are the silvers, and the 90s are the golds. Mm-hmm. And so that, you know, since the, that's what it basically did for Whiskey Advocate for a long time. It's very much, they're very congruent, just different, Different end results, right? Um, and so that's how one competition is. Another mm-hmm. competition will say we're taking all of them and we're going to rate them. Like we'll give a we'll give a number, or we're going to give a medal coming out of each category. I mean, now there's so many competitions because right. that's a strong business model. And if you are a new rum coming out, you know you want to get that. Sure. You, you want to get that metal on there because that's going to, that's going to, to potentially Elevate sell for your you. Brand. Yeah. But what has happened is, is everyone is wise to all the competitions, and it's really, it's really become how the trade makes decisions. So the by trade, I mean the distributors, I mean um, a good chunk of the bar owners and, and the retailers. They buy, they'll buy, uh, like St. Germain was discovered at the San Francisco World Spirits Competition. Oh, now it's called it. Bartender's Ketchup. <laughs> you know, um, it, there's been a lot, of, a lot of brands that were discovered at these competitions. And, you know, for many, when Barrel Bourbon won last year, that was the first time that anybody had heard of it. Right. On the, on the national level. And I don't know if that ended up, working out for them or if they capitalized on it or what but it was a sure. that was a big win for them mm. and it was actually a big win for all sourced whiskey but uh w- with with that said so the the place is you know, i think we're probably we probably do have too many competitions <laughs> but at the same time i i've always wanted like a, a genuine kind of like consumer report style one where there's no you know you you partner with like a retailer and you and you do the competition but you'll see that when you start putting these on you have to pay for glasses you have to pay the judges i mean Cost money, yeah. you know we we're professionals you know the, pe- the people at these competitions you know they're not they're not you know sally hung over at the local bar <laughs> you know they're they're people who's They've honed in their palettes. They know what they're doing, right? And they're professionals. And so you have to get people at that caliber, or no one will respect it. 
for all the shit that San Francisco gets, it is the most respected in the trade. Absolutely. Because if you win that, you know, you take a look at the, those judges and you're like, that person signed off on my product. And if, a, if anything wins that, coming out of it, you know, they get tons of case sales. Right. Uh, but it's, that's the, the, the double golds, the, the category winners and all that. That's, that's where you want to be. Right. Uh, if you're if you're getting a bronze, that's a pat on the back. Come back next year, kind of thing. <laughs> Which Pappy got a mean. bronze this year? Really? Yeah, I gave I gave Pappy a bronze. I mean, wow. this is all blind. It was blind. It's all blind. Yeah. So we we know not what we're tasting. Mm. And and yeah, I gave Pappy a bronze. I think that is aside from everything else that you could have said at this day and age, one of the the best things that you can provide to give credence to what you do in these competitions. A, it's blind. B, you gave something that's really touted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <A> bronze medal. <laughs> One year, um, I, I I can't remember the year, but we didn't, and I don't remember the exact brand, but we didn't medal one of the Buffalo Trace Antique collections. Uh, I don't remember what it was, but... Mm-hmm. There was but, an yeah, uproar. <laughs> it was... Um, it didn't get a medal. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of people would be shocked by that. And... And that's another thing. It's like they give everybody medals and, and everything. Um, again, just going by what how we're how we're told to judge. Sure. If that was if that was a competition that only gave three medals, you know, I, I don't know how many entries they would get. Right. Because I've done those that only give three medals. Yeah. And again, these are businesses. They're not they're not nonprofits. Sure. You know so. So it is. It is a business model that has been in play for for a few decades. Sure. And um, you know what used to happen was we used to we used to give a lot of credence to the county fairs. So like if you won like the Kentucky County Fair or, or the Jefferson County Fair or something like that, that used to right. be, that would be a big deal. Mm-hmm. You know what's gotten lost in our culture is that kind of agricultural competition. And really, this is this is all distilled agriculture. Sure, and uh, and this is this is a part of that. Now, if anybody wants to start a, a competition that could really knock the socks off the world, I and they have a bankroll to do it. <laughs> you can find me at uh, fredminick.com. <laughs> Let me know, and uh, Perry and I will and get this going. Well, yeah, we'll make it work. I think we can make it happen. Um, just to wrap up real quickly, um, first off, I want to say thank you so much for sitting down with me oh it's opened up a little bit it has opened up a little bit yeah what are you getting now on the on the mckenna i'm getting some like butter pecan interesting i love butter pecan ice cream mm-hmm. so it's like creamy and like a little bit of that bitterness from the pecan i'm that really sometimes happy. happens when you get a bottle that's really low like it like low fill on it right it, it the needs longer to, it sits yeah well, gotta I'll, drink this stuff i'll i'll probably you know if i don't finish it up soon i'll transfer it over to a smaller bottle just for safekeeping. Anyway, what is on the horizon for you? Because you, you just came out with Mead, your new... Uh, yeah, I came out with that. Book. I came out with uh, that, which nobody, including my mom, doesn't know why I wrote that one. <laughs> um, and, you know, and I've got, uh, you know, I've got Bourbon and Beyond, which yep. I helped co-found. And uh, this year we've got such an incredible lineup with Sting and Robert Plant. And yeah. And uh, all those great musicians and chefs and bourbon stuff, um, and then I've got you know my magazine that I'm I'm starting Bourbon Plus is yeah. really a dream. It's like, you know, when as soon as I started writing for publications about bourbon, I was like I I would love to do something on a grander scale. Like I wanted to I wanted to write about the soul and the personality of bourbon, and a lot of people. A lot of magazines really want it to be about the liquid, and that's that's probably the the most mainstream you can get with sure. whiskey is like saying like, oh, this is good, you should drink that. Mm-hmm. It's a fantastic model. I just felt like it's time to go real in depth on people like Jimmy Russell and and Bill Samuels. Um, you know, one of the feature stories, you know, we open it up with um, Bill Samuels walking into a meeting with a gun. <laughs> so that's the kind of stuff we're going that's to so Bill Samuels. Stuff. We're going to bring out. 
Well, Fred, again, thank you so much for, for hanging out. Oh, my says. pleasure. We'll, uh, I'm sure we'll have you back on, especially because once we get closer to Bourbon and Beyond. Yeah, absolutely. So, appreciate it, man. Pleasure. Always a pleasure. Yeah. Cheers. So if you would like to follow up with Fred on social media, you can find him at Fred Minnick pretty much everywhere, including Instagram and Twitter. And then if you just search Fred Minnick on Facebook, you'll be able to find him there as well. I'm actually not going to be doing a review segment on this week's episode, as it would be a little bit awkward, you know, just having myself in, in the room being the only one reviewing. But I am sipping on Wilderness Trail Bottom and Bond. If you want to go and check out our actual review of this bourbon, Go back uh, probably about 10 episodes ago. I think that's when it was. Curtis and Swan and I actually reviewed this one. So go check that out. Uh, Chad and Sarah and I drank on it too a few weeks ago. But I am going to be doing a a tips and bits segment for you though. And to kind of keep with the theme of Fred Minnick, uh, I'm going to recommend his book, Bourbon Curious. So what it is, is it's basically just a... It, along with a, a very short history on bourbon in, in the industry, you also get tasting notes for a lot of specific bourbons. You know, we're talking Maker's Mark, we're talking Weller 12, we're talking, you know, anything across the board that you can pretty much think of. And it's a really great introduction for less than experienced bourbon drinkers if you're trying to expand your palate. And if you're trying to learn more about what it is that you're tasting, and even for some of us more, we'll say experienced, I use that term fairly lightly, bourbon drinkers, it does kind of provide more context, context rather, to what it is that you are, are experiencing on your palate and on the finish, and really just as an overall experience with the bourbon. So <clears throat> I would highly recommend that you go and buy that. It's a fantastic book. And uh, I actually got a signed copy from Fred when I I went and hung out with him last week. So anyway, that about does it for me this week. I want to say thanks again to Fred for being on the show. Uh, He's a fantastic guy, and I really enjoyed our conversation with him. I'm sure we'll have him back on in the future. Uh, If you would like to follow up with me on social media, you can head to at PRitter1492 pretty much anywhere. And then if you would like to follow the show... You can head to at my bourbon pod on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And then if you would like to send us an email, you can use uh, this is my bourbon shop at gmail.com. You can become a patron of the show as well if you head to patreon.com slash my bourbon podcast. And for as little as a dollar a month, uh, you know, th- this isn't, it, it may be free for you to listen, but it's not free for us to do a lot of these things, um, you know, the travel that's involved and the hosting fees, you know, it, it really does help us out. So if you really do enjoy the show and you would like to keep us going, you know, we, I've said this before, we have no intention of quitting anytime soon. So please, if you are able to help us out a little bit, we would really appreciate it. Uh, also give us a five star rate and review on iTunes. It really helps us out too, for people to become more aware of the show also, thank you all so much for listening. We, uh, of course, wouldn't be where we are without you all. You guys are really what keep us going and making this as much fun as it is for us. Um, next week, I believe that I'm going to be having Curtis and Tanner back on for a brand new episode with the Home Base Boys. And if not, I will let you know on social media something might change. But I will keep you posted on that. Until then, I will see you next week. I'm Perry, and this is my bourbon podcast. <laughs>